What's the most difficult part of writing a screenplay for you? It's the, it's the 110 page thing. Oh, the, being boxed into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because every first draft is always 175 pages. But your first drafts, do they run that long sometimes? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, they, I've never, I, I, I actually know some people who like their first drafts are like 80 pages and then they have to go like pad. <laughs> I mean, like my rule is always if I finish a script and this is not, I'm talking more about a spec, there's five people that I give it to and, and um, I will take a few weeks off while they're reading it and think about other things and then start getting their notes. Right. And it, it's always good if like, because they're three very, they're five very different people and um, if they all have, if some of them have the same, you know, it's that if three people tell you you're drunk, lie down thing, you know, right. like, okay, well, I guess they're right. Um, but then, but that, 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 that starting to cut is, once you had like some distance from it, you go back and it's actually one of the most satisfying things is like, oh my God, that scene, I thought I needed that scene so much, how long so you, much better without that scene. How long do you put it down for before you come back to it and, and start pruning? Usually at least a week. It's, okay. it's hard because it's there and you want to get at it and you can't really focus on anything else until you have. And it, did that process for you evolve over time? The, I write my first draft, I put it down for a week, come back to it, did that, was that trial and error? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because I would, you, you just, when it's so fresh, you're so wed to it and you can't, like I, I just wrote that, I'm not getting rid of that right. scene. You so know? you get some feedback from kind of family and friends uh -huh. and then go back to it. Then go back and look at How it. How many yeah. times would you hit up a, like a, uh, internal first draft and prune it before you go out with it. I will never give anybody 170 pages. Sure. It, it'll, you know, right. it tops 130. I just wouldn't, you know. So you do your process until I you get to process. a length you yeah. feel like, okay, how do you know when to stop? You, you just know, you just say, you know what, I can't cut anymore. Right. I, I, I really can't. And the truth of the matter is, these movies, they should, unless you're doing, you know, Saving Private Ryan or, or um, you know, 1900 or something, right. then. They, they, they shouldn't be 170 pages, especially if it's a comedy or like a romantic <laughs> comedy or right. a horror movie or something like that. Right. Um, but, so there is obviously something wrong. Mm -hmm. There is a fatal error if, if, you're, if you're, you know, if liar, liar is 170 pages, sure. you know? How do you approach, when you're writing uh, scenes or dealing with subject matter you have no first-hand knowledge of, are you a big research uh, fanatic? Do you do a lot of research mm -hmm. in that situation? That's the best part of the job. Like, I love that. Like, Gone in 60 Seconds was a perfect example. Tell, tell, walk me through the research for that. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually, on Gone in 60 Seconds, which is about car thieves, my original was, as all my originals are, set in Boston, and then they become Long Beach mysteriously right. all the time. Have you had a big Hollywood movie shoot in Boston? Nope. That's a goal. We're, we're trying. <laughs> um, Set in Boston, but not actually Minnesota sure. was Boston, you know. Um, what I did was I met all of these car thieves. We, we, actually, Jerry Bruckheimer produced that also, and he put together all these, these car thief meetings for us here in L.A. and in New York. And with ex-cons? With, or just with, people that hadn't been caught? Both. Okay. Some ex-cons and some people that hadn't been caught. And we get met, a car off the production? We did, <laughs> no. We did, uh, we did, um, it, the, the great, there's this place, Shay Jay's in Santa Monica. And oh, the steakhouse? The, 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 yeah, okay. the back room there. We would meet, we'd have these like very clandestine meetings. It was the director right. and myself. It's and, a pitch black restaurant. You can't even see your right, hand in front of your face in yeah. that restaurant. Kate, Nick, um, and uh, this is when Nick got involved too, but even this is before we were writing the script. I had to write that script in 10 days. Wow. That was a, the, 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 gone the, in 10 days. Gone in 10 days. So it was very, it was all in the rewriting that I was really doing much of the research. But the thing was, I was meeting all these car thieves. And the one thing that these car thieves lacked, which I felt was the only way this movie could succeed, which but I'm not a fan of the movie, like the original script, I, as, if I say so myself, was pretty great. Is that an example of the, not to digress, but is that, if you had a call, if you had to name one that disappointed you the most from, from, script to feature, disturbing behavior aside, because I know that story. Yeah, but that, that disturbing behavior wasn't, Low it was, budget, never, it was yeah. never such a great script. Right. And we, we certainly didn't have the magnificent cast that we had in Gone in 60 Seconds. Sure. And, Would you say Gone oh, was abso the one? Oh, absolutely. Okay. That was totally my Waterloo. Okay. Um, but, but now getting back to the car thieves. So, so what happened was these car thieves were, they were great and they had a lot of knowledge, but what they didn't have, and I realized the only way this movie could succeed, was they had to, they had to have a love for the cars. They had, there had to be poetry. They needed to, they, they needed to, we needed to get across the, the poetry within them. Right. And 
it wasn't happening with these thieves. These thieves, bottom line, they were stealing for the money. Right. The real thieves. So I just had this brilliant idea, which I'm sure I couldn't have been mine. Somebody must have given it to me along the way because it was too good an idea for me to have. Was why don't I meet, why don't I get a bunch of like car lovers, like car, car club guys, car aficionados, and get them together. So I was, I write in Boston a lot, and I was in Boston, and I got, the, the guy who writes like the car column for the Boston Globe, I got in touch with him, and I told him I was writing this movie, Gone in 60 Seconds, and it's, you know, about a guy who has to steal 50 cars in one night, and I would love if he and his buddies would, if I could take them to dinner. So we went to this big, this Italian place in the North End, and I got them hammered. We just, I just said like, you, you keep pouring the Chianti into these guys' wine. And they just started talking about cars and about how they, and I'm, I'm furiously writing it down, tape recorded the whole thing. And it was, I mean, there was a scene, I don't even know if it's in, I didn't even saw the final film, by the way. Like, I was so, like, horrified by it. Like, right. I saw, like, an early cut, and I knew the direction they were going did in. You t- did you go to test screenings, or did you but, stop? No, or? I had quit. Okay. I checked out, gotcha. you know, deep early. Okay. It was bad. But, by the way, Jerry's going to watch this, and he's going <laughs> to, he, he, he always says, like, whatever you do, it's like omerta. Never shit on a film that you've right. that you Well, this is more made. nuts and bolts discussion. It's yeah, bad. by the way, Jerry, I love you. <laughs> right. um, the, the, I don't know if it was in the, but there was this great scene in the original script where it was one of those very, you know, the typical things where they all, while they're all casing their various places, they're all, like, mic'd, and they all can communicate, and they started doing this trivia, like, about famous cars in television. Like, what color was the interior of Mannix's, you know, Challenger? Right. And the other guys answering that. It was, and it, ha- it, it happened at this, at this dinner where these guys just, you know, what's the interior of the, du- the General Lee and Dukes of Hazzard? Oh, I'm like, well, fun. you know, whatever changed. It was like that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And they, so basically, I married the two, the, the, the love and the sort of language of the, the, the ardor these guys had for cars with the sort of technical nuts and bolts stuff that I was getting for the thieves, and that was what the sort of gang, okay, and that, that's and how they spoke. So that, that research was very one-on-one interviews mm-hmm. with people, and you kind of blended your right. research into the characters that became the characters in the film. For sure. How do you approach writing for women? You know, they have such a singular voice, and, and a lot of your scripts have been very female-centric. Is it a separate process when you know you're going to be writing for the female characters in Beautiful Girls or the female characters in High Fidelity? Beautiful Girls is always, High Fidelity, everything, you know, no matter what anybody wants to say about High Fidelity, everything great, by the way, it's beautifully made film, beautifully cast film, but everything great in High Fidelity was in the book. Okay. The book was extraordinary. Including I mean, the voice of the women? Absolutely. The book was amazing. I mean, that was one of those things, where I was tremendously busy at the time, and my agent called me up, it was Mike Newell was directing it originally. Um, and they want to offer you this book. It was in galleys, and they sent it to me. And I said, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not available. I'm busy. I owe everybody in town. I can't do it. I can't do it. And I read the book. And it was the spooky. I was like, okay, Nick Hornby is like, is he living in my attic? <laughs> like, it so spoke to me because right. I had just come off the seven year relationship. I was really into music. I was a complete basket case. Um, and it was just, I was like, I have to do this. I have to do this. So I, I worked on it a lot with Mike, and then Mike went away. And then Johnny came in, and then it was a whole, it was a separate thing. But, um, but Beautiful Girls is really very specific, too, because, like, nobody really speaks in Beautiful Girls like people speak. Right. Like, it's a very sort of heightened kind of... Right. Scott um, speak. Scott speak. Like, very sort of... Right. Yeah, a little silly, a little self-indulgent. Well, do you approach writing for women differently than you I, approach writing I, all, for men? All women are self-indulgent. <laughs> I write no, no, I actually don't. Okay. I actually don't. Um, I, I, I try and, I try and uh, write them the same. And I, obviously I draw off of, you know, of the women in my life right. and the women I know. To me, it's like that, that whole thing about, um, like, you know, if you write black people different from white people, right. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Like, hey, bro? Right, like, right. No, you don't, right. you just write it. You just you write know? naturally, and then yeah. the actors bring what they're going to bring mm-hmm. to the process. Mm-hmm. Is writing for an ensemble different than writing a screenplay, you know, for one star? Like when you were writing for the ensembles of some of your I films? pretty much only write ensembles, it okay. seems like. I mean, I, that's... I love that. That's what I'm all about. But it, it's obviously, if you're, you know, you're, it, it's so much more fun to write for the, the minor characters than it is for the lead, ultimately, you mm-hmm. know? But no, you just approach it the same way. And I, I always think that you, I always try and, that's why the scripts are 176 pages, because to me it's all about actor bait. Right. Like I'm, I learned that on Things to Do in Denver, which was just like everybody in that original script, everybody right. had a monologue. 
every, I mean, everybody, number 23 on the call sheet had a monologue, you right. know? And we got the amazing cast. Mm -hmm. And I really, I was sort of corrupted by that. So does I that, did, car does that do carry it. over to your work today where you, 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 you know, let me, you know, if I put enough, a block of dialogue here, my chances it's of getting an actor. It's not even a block. It's not that calculated because right. I'm only going to, I'm only interested in writing my characters that are interesting. Right. And having them have, you know, do fun stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, it was very early in my career, there was this guy who, who I don't even know what happened to him. He was very young. He, like, he was a junior agent somewhere. And I was struggling and I met him. I was bartending and he read a script of mine and he said, don't worry, kid. He was, he was younger than me, but he called me kid. Right. Because he was like working. He said, you'll be fine. And I said, why? He said, because you write good, you write cool stuff and actors want to say cool stuff and actors drive Hollywood. Did he become yeah. a senior agent or was really he too wise to, to stay in the business? He really <laughs> was. He was too sage. Well, I want to discuss a, a particular scene with you that you've cited as a, as a strong example of your work. And it's a lovely scene in Beautiful Girls where Marty is ice skating and, uh, you know, is noticed by, or she notices Timothy Hutton as Willie watching her and they get together and discuss kind of the improbability of their relationship and the un unlikelihood of them ending up together. Beautiful Girls was a really interesting thing where um, I, had, I, had in, I had written things to do in Denver which somehow got me con air and I was waiting for them to basically say okay you can go to script and it took like three weeks and I was back in Boston and I come from a very small, it was then a very blue collar town, all my buddies were still there they all drive snow plows. We were all dealing with the fact that we were about to turn 30 and we couldn't deal with women and commitment. I just ended a seven, the seven year relationship, right. the girl that I followed out here. I, I, I was so tired of writing like shooting people and, 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 and racial epithets and the whole thing, right. which with Denver and Conair were. And I said, there's more quote action going on with my buddies and the fact that they can't commit and the women <laughs> and the whole thing. And I was just in a really kind of dark place and I, I was invited. This is now, this is gonna sound like really creepy, <laughs> but I was invited to the bat mitzvah of my cousin, okay, who was 13 years old. She had moved away when I was like, when she was like six. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't seen her and it was down in Florida. My father, my father's like dead now, like not long. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriend relationships ended and I'm, I'm just in a kind of a bad place. And her and I struck up this friendship. Like we, I was down there in, 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 in Florida for like five or six days and I was just like, I was just marveling at her. I was like, this is such, this is, because it was all about, he says it in the thing, because there was nothing sexual about it at all. Of course. But it was all about, here I was at, at 29 years old, or 30 years old, and I wasn't happy. And this girl was all about hope. It was, she, she, it, to me, it was like, wow, what this girl's gonna become is gonna be, is just extraordinary. What a profound encounter. And it was, yeah, it really was. And I, and I, and I always love um, putting, putting the most honest truths in the mouths of the most, unlike, most unlikely people. And so, it was sort of those two things. When, when I sat down to write Beautiful Girls, which um, it's funny because Jim Brooks said it. He said, if you can't find the girl, you don't make this movie. As wow. good as it is, you don't make the movie. And we were really, really lucky that in 1995 or whatever it is, that extraordinary creature actually existed, which was Natalie Portman. Because it's like, you, by the way, we saw, we saw millions of girls. Because I did it, again, I remember I did it with Jim Brooks. And then I did it again with Teddy. Mm -hmm. We saw every girl on the, on the block. And, and did Natalie Portman come from just uh, auditions or had she been recommended? Who found Natalie Portman for you guys? Well, Natalie Portman had done um, the, the um, Luc Besson, the Luc Besson the professional. Movie. But it was, it, it wasn't out yet. Right. But I mean, somebody, I can't remember who was. Was there ever, buzz on her from that? Not even, really. Even though it hadn't come out yet? Not, not really. really. I mean, we didn't, we didn't know about buzz. We just knew, you know, this girl came in and, I mean, there was buzz from her agent, you sure. know? And she just came in and she was just, she was unbelievable. How much of, of Marty is the 13 year old girl from the bat mitzvah? Not, not much at all, but my father's name is Marty, was Marty. Okay. And she says it in the, in the, he says as in Martha, and she says, no, as in Marty, named for a grandfather I never even knew. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of that, you know, it was, it was there. So every time I watch it now, you know, it, it gets me misty. It's on all the time, by the way. Yes, it is. It's, it's the craziest thing. It's like the beautiful girls channel. Since it is a scene between a, a 30 year old man and a, a, a 13 year old girl, was there, any, was there ever any talk about, hey, this might come off inappropriate? Or was it, did you all believe that 
No, that's not even a concern. It, it's never going to be about that or suggest that. Well, it's funny because it, it's addressed in a scene. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's 100, I mean, you know, the, the first thing they teach you in film school is like, always anticipate what your audience is going to think and beat them to it. Right. And there is a scene, it's, it's the night before, it's why the one, it's sort of like the one visual joke in the whole thing, because he's, the night before, it's, it's after, it's this after the party, and, and it's like the, in the boozy afterglow of this surprise party that just went awry, mm -hmm. and the Tim Hutton character is sitting with his buddy, the Noah Emmerich character, and he's trying to explain how he feels about this girl. And he said, and he states right up front, just what I told you. He said, it, it's not, it's not right. sexual so you at got, all. You got out in front it's of It's about what she could be. It's about hope. It's, yeah, you got out in front mm -hmm. of it. And then the next day on the ice skating rink, she, she falls into his arms. And just as, as, as the Noah Emmer character is skating by with his buddies and he like gives him this horrified look. Disarms is, the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Why an ice skating rink? It was a movie of, it was people talking. It was very interior, but it was set in winter and you wanted, it was that New England feel and you wanted, my friends were ice fishermen and a lot of it, you know, a lot of it set, was set in the ice fishing shack. Okay. So it came from that. That's a good reason. Mm -hmm. now the, the Christopher Robin and the Pooh reference, like where did that come from? And did that involve research or was that just no, something No, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been obsessed with, with, uh, Poo? with, with Pooh <laughs> forever. It's, it's, it's sort of my standard, my standard thing. Um, is it from a, a, that same wistful place of like looking back on your youth or thinking about youth? It's not that. Okay. I just think that, I think that in all of literature, the, the, no one is more brilliant than, than Winnie the Pooh. Right. I mean, he's, he says some things that you can, you can apply every, my, my favorite Winnie the Pooh ever. And I, I mean, I, I've used it for every single purpose is they, they asked Winnie, they, they, they said, um, what's, what's the greatest thing ever in the world? And he said, uh, the greatest thing in the world is eating honey. And then he thought about it a second. He said, no, 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 that's not the greatest thing ever. The greatest thing ever is right as I'm about to eat the honey. I don't know what you call that thing, but that's the greatest thing ever. And I just think that, that that's sort of, that's, that's so beautiful. And that, because it's true. It's a, it, the anticipation. It's the anticipation. We've got a little screenwriting exercise for you because I know you love them. Uh, it's called uh, The Object. Frederick, the tray, please. Frederick is bringing over an object. It's uh, encased in this tray. It was, it's Hi, cho Frederick. Chosen very carefully by us. Uh, it'll be totally random to you. And the object <laughs> of the object is when, once Frederick reveals it, you size it up, make up a story, tell me the story, and then I'll ask you why that story. Are you serious? Yes, I am. Okay. And it, it doesn't need to be like an Oscar-winning screenplay. It doesn't need to be that's, like a long thing. I'm, I'm not, it was, it was, okay. <laughs> and uh, are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Show the man his object. Your object, sir. Thank you, uh, Frederick. It's a blindfold. Freeform, no rules. Uh, a, a movie or just a, story? a story? Just a story. Like pretend you're telling me a bedtime story. Pretend that you, you're playing Animal Crackers with my cave. <laughs> with your cave? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> um, right, pop that out of your head. Yeah, pop that out of this film. <laughs> um, wow, blindfold, blindfold. There's so many. Uh, there's so many stories that come to mind. Forget the ones where you used one. <laughs> it was 1:30 in the morning when he decided he was going to follow the shot girl home. He'd been watching her all night. She was beautiful. She looked exactly like this girl that he knew in high school. Her name had been Randy. Um, Randy. <laughs> she wasn't Randy though. He, he wouldn't know if she was Randy or not because he never even got close to her. But the shot girl looked exactly like her. It was probably because he, he had been wanting to get her attention that he did lots of shots because he kept buying them from her. And she was so there and present while he was handing over his five dollars and while she was putting the little test tube of some amber colored liquid down his throat. And then the minute the, the, the liquid disappeared down his throat, she all of a sudden something like switched off in her eyes and she became back to the Randy from, from high school, um, not interested in him at all. Um, and he hated that look. He hated that look in her eyes. So he got drunker and drunker and angrier and angrier. And it was around 1.30 when he decided that he would follow her home. <clears throat> it was last call. 
because they were, they, were uh, they were in Boston. And the last call was 1.30, so we waited outside. It was a cold night. It was November. It was a week before Thanksgiving. And he knew that they would all stick around and have drinks, you know. Service people would come from other bars and other clubs, and they would sit. Cute bartenders. Guys making less money than he did. He was, a, he was, he was, a, he was in finance. He made a good living. But he couldn't get her attention. But some bartender who was making, you know, you know, just above the minimum wage, drink all night with her, and she would like him. So we waited outside. We waited across the street in the, in the shadows of a bank. We waited for them to come out. And she came out. And everyone, everyone lived close. Everyone lived, it was college, you know. It was that part of Boston, Cambridge, actually. <clears throat> so we followed her. We followed her and her girlfriend. Because he knew that he, he'd, okay, we'll admit it. He'd done it before. But this time, he was just drunk enough. He had actually brought, he had, he had brought the, 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 the sleep mask from home. Funny thing, buying a sleep mask like this. Never really could use him because it, it would make him sweat. He tried once on a plane. Maybe that's where he got it. The one time he flew first class. British Air, I think it was. <clears throat> but that's a whole other story. <laughs> so he had it. And uh, he followed him home, and he knew the girl. The girl's name was Denise, her friend, the Randy girl, whose name escapes us. He, he would drop Denise off at Denise's apartment and follow Randy to her apartment. And the, the door didn't, the, the, there was no security. It was, it was a six-floor walk-up. Mm -hmm. Not a particularly good neighborhood. And he followed her up, and he went up, and she went inside her apartment. And he went up, the light was the light was not great. It smelled kind of. Somebody had just peed in their stairwell recently. He finally arrives at the sixth floor landing and he knocks on the door. Hello? I think she just assumes it was Denise. What did, what did you, did you forget something? She opened it. It's sixth floor. Who th even thinks about it? And she's had a few herself. And she opens the door. There's no chain. She just opens the door and there she is. And how did she manage to change so quickly? She's already wearing a t-shirt and, 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 and just her underwear, a long t-shirt. I mean, it covered what needed to be covered. And her feet was bare and he always, he, always, he always liked, he didn't have a foot fetish. That would be unfair to say that he had a foot fetish. But he liked barefoot girls. Um, and there she was and she was standing there. And there was that vague flash of recognition. Once again, man, those eyes, it flash. That's the thing, that's the thing. Because it would flash and this time, this time it was recognition. And first it was, a, it was a happy recognition. It was like, wow, I know you from somewhere. And oh my God, if he could just live in that forever. But he couldn't, because that was quickly gone. And it was replaced with revulsion? Was that revulsion? It was the revulsion. The revulsion that reminds me of, 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 reminded me of Randy. Of Randy. And he went in, and he went in hard, and he went in strong, and he pushed her back into her apartment, quickly looking around the apartment. It wasn't a bad apartment, it was kind of nice. Oh my God, she likes the cult. I never would have figured that. She's only like 20. I didn't even know the cult are. But there was a poster, a cult. And he got her down and he brought her down to her knees. And at this time, she's not screaming because she's a little confused. And he, 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 so he's, he's a strong guy. I don't know if we mentioned that, but he's strong. He's big. He works out. He likes to work out. He's a big guy. He's not tall, but he's big. And he had, quickly had her hands, those wrists, they're very slim. And he had them behind her back. And so quickly, you'd think he was doing this forever. Certainly not a guy who works, you know, dealing with things wall street things could do he slipped that mask over her eyes to shut them out so he couldn't so he wouldn't so not again would he be reminded of randy and he stood over her and she is now blindfolded or he's behind her rather but he's looking and he's there and she's all of a sudden now she starts to panic and now maybe she starts to scream and he kissed her on the forehead a very light kiss the next morning she wouldn't even be able to remember that she was kissed. And then he got up and he turned around and on his way out, he picked up a, a cult CD. There was one cult CD and he picked it up and he put it in his jacket pocket and he closed the door and he went downstairs and he went out into the street and he went home and for the first time in months, for some reason, he was happy. Wow. I'm so glad she made it through that evening. <laughs> yeah, we decided we wouldn't, we wouldn't kill her. That's so interesting. You, 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 you um, weaved in so many great details to that story. 
but uh, how did you, when you first saw that, how did you get to immediately, this, this is a story about this man, at least for that night, being able to get rid of Randy's look, or Randy's look of revulsion towards him. Like that came, it seemed to come together fairly quickly, but. You know, oh, I, I did, because, because they, they already, you know, the, this guy, <laughs> he and I, we drink together on Mondays and he told me he, he was going to. He tipped it to like, the yeah, object. No, um, honestly, it's, it's, it's uh, um, the, I, the, that, that first line, that was the thing. Okay. And things like the details, like the cult CD and. That's you know, just, I, you just, I don't I have no idea. When you write, do you, do you think of details like that? Mm-hmm. It's all about the details. <laughs> 